it's often called the Asian Davos, and it's a somewhat similar gathering. So we get political leaders, uh, quite often top Chinese leaders, up to the level of Xi Jinping, will put in appearances. Uh, you get dignitaries from the business world and the government world and from academia. Uh, that all gather to talk about uh, the state of affairs in the world, particularly Asia, in the case of Baal. And obviously, the, the state of the world at the moment, a precarious one for a lot of countries. So just how important is this forum, especially given some of the risks and the challenges amid the pandemic? Well, I think it is an important moment. I mean, Bilal has been around long enough, 20 years, as you know, uh, that it has become a major gathering place for people of the type we've been talking about. And it's, of course, quite an important moment because not only is it the 20th anniversary, which is you know a big deal, but because it is this first live uh, major international conference of something like 2,000 people showing up live. So that's an important signal of perhaps getting past uh, the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns that follow it. And of course, the question of economic growth, particularly economic growth in Asia, is very much on everyone's mind, and the ability to gather in person is, in a way, a signal of, of optimism on that front. Plus, you know, the GDP numbers that are up in China, and, and much of the theme at Bilal is about intra-Asian uh, trade and, and integration. And to that point, we know that President Xi is expected to speak at the opening ceremony later today. What are the expectations for his address? Well, I think this is a moment for China to assert a number of, of focuses and goals. So one is, of course, to show that China is back and the economy is growing. It is an attempt to put forward what Xi Jinping will probably describe as an Asian perspective, and some might describe as a Chinese perspective on global governance. Uh, it is uh, an attempt to promote the continuation of China playing a major role in intra-Asian economic integration. We're not too far past the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, going into effect. So there's that set of economic themes. There's an attempt to hit the theme of openness. Uh, one of the notable sort of side events is the U.S.-China Entrepreneurs Symposium, which is an attempt to sort of keep the business side of what is on the political side a very fraught U.S.-China relation. Uh, kind of up and going. There's some major U.S. corporate titans showing up to that end. Uh, and of course, uh, in addition to COVID, which is on everyone's mind and will be a focus here, I expect we'll get some discussion of the role that China has played in uh, sending vaccines out to the world and in China's uh, successes after some initial uh, missteps on the, on the COVID crisis. And we're also going to see, I think, some emphasis on carbon neutrality. China has set a goal of carbon neutrality of 2060 with peak carbon in 2030. Uh, and that's obviously a big theme. It's one of the few areas where people are somewhat hopeful about U.S.-China cooperation. Uh, former Secretary, now I guess climate czar Kerry's visit uh, to China was to hit those themes. So I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see the economy, COVID, Asian integration, and, uh, and carbon. And obviously, this event is going to run over the course of, of a few days. So what have been the highlights so far? And, and what are you looking forward to this year in the forum? Well, I mean, I think yeah, there's there's a limit to how super exciting these events get when you're watching them from the outside. A lot of the interesting discussions, I think, go on as sidebars. But um, I think one of the themes we have have seen is is this reemphasis on economic growth and on essentially uh, a, an Asia centric. Uh, world in many ways. Um, I, I think you know, the leadership spe speeches are always uh, of considerable note. Um, and you know, we'll see whatever deliverables come out of it. But uh, I think these are more important for uh, putting forth the themes that the hosts and the other participants want to put forward. And again, for marking a return to a degree of normalcy in being able to hold this kind of meeting. Now, as you mentioned, this is coming on the heels of things like RCEP. There was also the Asian Economic Report released over the weekend that also explored the recession, but the rapid rebound, some of the debt challenges, um, and really sort of the role of what happens in China and Asia and its impact on the global economy. What really stands out to you as what might be the biggest drivers as well as the biggest challenges to growth in the region? Well, so one of the biggest drivers is the relatively rapid recovery of Chinese economic growth from the downturn following COVID. Uh, RCEP, I think, is still untested. Uh, you know, it is it is symbolically significant, but how much it's really going to affect trade it remains to be seen. It's not a terribly deeply integrative agreement than it is in its infancy. Uh, the title of Bilal this year, of course, emphasizes Belt and Road Initiative cooperation, and that's obviously been a major focus for China throughout the uh, the Xi Jinping era, pretty much. Uh, so I think in terms of, of drivers, it's, it's you know, Chinese growth, intra-Asian integration, and uh, the, the as yet 
not fully realized uh, implications of RCEP and BRI. As to the obstacles, uh, well, you know, we're still in a tough time. Most of the world is not vaccinated. You're seeing rates of COVID go up quite dramatically in the developing world. One of the puzzles was why the developing world hadn't been hit harder. And now, unfortunately, we're starting to see it in India in particular, but in Brazil. Uh, and that's a real uh, threat. Those are two big economies. Uh, and I think we're also just seeing uh, the fallout that we don't really fully understand the contours of, of U.S.-China rivalry. Uh, we have not seen uh, a return to a pre-Trump era normalcy. The tariffs are still in place. Uh, the U.S. is being quite vocal about the complaints it has about China's economic behavior. Uh, and China has shown a, a uh, preparedness to engage in some sort of tit-for-tat facts and force on this front. So those, the obstacles of, of protectionism and of uh, concern about what each side regards as the other's political use of economic openness, I think, is is a real threat. Um, plus, you know, not all the world is growing very well yet, not just for COVID reasons. Even if we could put the pandemic behind us tomorrow, it's going to take some time to take back up the slack to figure out uh, how much economic readjustment uh, is, is coming out of COVID. And one of the big unanswered issues is how much the supply chain issues are going to come into it.